nowadays I get a lot of questions um, about pornography. Mm. And the, the discussion around pornography is always related to the discussion around masturbation. Um, but let's just talk about pornography for a moment in this context of these primitive drives and these circuits within the hypothalamus, which we were all born with that um, clearly some of them are devoted to our progression as a species through reproduction. Mm -hmm. Zero question about that. Sexual behavior being linked to reproduction. Not always, but certainly. Mm -hmm. We can all agree on that. It's I, a necessary I, precondition. I hope we can still all agree on that. But um, last time I checked, that's still true. A sperm and an egg met someplace in some context to create all of us. <laughs> okay. We're still grounded in that. Pornography is something that I hear quite a lot from typically young males but sometimes young females mm -hmm. or even older females who say that they can see themselves trying to resist the desire to go look at it. Mm -hmm. And it almost doesn't feel like a desire anymore. They're sort of just in a um, kind of a, a, a compulsion that is, that is almost unconscious, but they're mm -hmm. just aware of the fact like that they're- Like an eating disorder. Like an eating disorder. They're, they're doing it, they know they shouldn't be doing it, and they can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. and. We could think about two ways to attack this, if one believes it's a real concern, and they certainly do, so I do. Um, I don't, I would be open if I, if I had or do. I, pornography has not been my thing, and, and I don't struggle with it. But, but when I hear from these people, it's so clear that they're asking, is it the prevalence of pornography out there? Or is it something really broken in them? Like, are they broken? But I don't know that I would say after having the discussion we've had thus far that they're broken. It seems to me that it's like the, as you said, it's the manifestation of one part of their, mm -hmm. it's one personality within them. Well, and yeah. it's been, it's been compulsively rewarded. So, you know, when, when a, when you see yourself moving towards the culmination of a desired goal, a dopamine, that's accompanied by dopamine release, okay? Mm -hmm. And so two things, you know this, but everybody mm -hmm. who's listening might not. Mm -hmm. There's two elements to that dopamine release. One is pleasure, mm -hmm. but the other is that the dopamine, imagine that there are circuits activated as you're acting. What the dopamine does is increase the probability that the circuits were that were activated just before the positive experience happened grow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now if you're engaged with pornography and that culminates in, sec in, in successful sexual satiation, which it can, that's what masturbation does, then the whole personality that's oriented toward that set of stimuli is going to come to dominate. It's very much like an addiction, except it's, it's you know, there, there has been, there's been work done with generally simpler animals on these phenomena called super stimuli. I think it's stickleback fish where this was first observed. So males, I hope I get this right, but I've got it approximately right. I believe it's male sticklebacks will, they're very aggressive towards other male sticklebacks. And the reason they're aggressive is because the other male sticklebacks have a red dot on their bellies. So they don't like red dots at all. And so you can really enrage a stickleback with a red dot. And if you use a red dot that's a little bigger and a little brighter than the typical red dot, you get a super stimulus. Hmm. It's virtually irresistible to the stickleback. And it's weird because the maximal activation is produced by a stimulus that they wouldn't see in nature. It slightly exceeds, the, that's exactly what pornography does. It's a super hmm. stimulus, hmm. right? And it's not surprising that young males in particular are susceptible to that because male sexuality in human beings is very visually oriented. Very, and a lot of our brain is visual, way more than virtually every other animal, certainly every other primate and, ver and every other mammal. And so we have a situation where any 13-year-old boy can see more hyper-attractive, super-stimulus women in one day than the most successful man who ever lived 100 years ago would have ever seen in his whole life. Yeah, well, that's a, like an evolutionary, ecological, radical ecological transformation. And... The, and it's worse because it's easily accessible, so it takes no work, right? So not only is it a super stimulus, it's one that's at hand, so to speak. And, the, uh, and the, uh, the analog in the food world would be sugar. highly palatable, highly processed food. Yeah, sugar, fat yeah. combination. You go into, the sure. other day I went into a gas station to use the restroom because I was traveling home for Thanksgiving. And, and I looked around and, I, and I, I thought, this isn't a convenience store. This is a pharmacy. 
Right. All, everything that had chocolate also also seemed to have caffeine and color. Everything, every drink seemed to combine not just sugar, but also caffeine and some other things that would provide stimu stimulants. Then you've got nicotine. Energy and, drinks. And, like. and, and these things on their own aren't necessarily bad. Any one of these one elements in low, low enough doses, in frequent use, et cetera. But maybe sugar being the one that, that clearly, I think, uh, deserves um, deeper investigation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but... It just well, occurred to me that the, the, different than difference between manufacturing sugar and manufacturing cocaine. I mm -hmm. mean, you take something that's available in its natural form in relatively low concentrations and purify it. Mm -hmm. I mean, coca leaves, the natives used coca leaves forever as mild stimulant, didn't seem to cause them any trouble, but that's way different than cocaine, mm -hmm. right? And sugar has the same, arguably, the same pathological properties. Well, I didn't so, think we were going to go here, but I think it's extremely appropriate and important that we do. So I, I know that you followed what is essentially an elimination diet for a number of years. You eat meat, mm -hmm. right? Um, I eat meat, vegetables, fruit, and um, some starches, unrefined starches. In any event, one thing that I think is absolutely clear from following a clean diet, so to speak, of any kind, but let's say of the sort that you follow or I follow, is that you very soon learn the relationship between taste of the food, volume of the food, macronutrient, so protein, fat, or carbohydrate content, micronutrients, and satiation, which is, if you think about it, it's sort of like a, a big plate of broccoli or a big steak or something, the brain learns and the hypothalamus learns the association between the taste, the caloric content, what else is in there, and satiation. If you think about highly processed food or even combinations of multiple ingredients, that's absolutely impossible to do. The brain can't parse what are the various things in here and how do they relate to my feelings of satisfaction. It's the difference between a super drug and what I believe are the, the elements that were Mm -hmm. that explain, we have explain why you think that's that yeah. link learn link about satiation can't be learned in the case of these processed foods. Yeah, because in the context of these processed foods, they're activating multiple neuron systems in the hypothalamus and gut. We know that the gut has neurons that can respond to sugar, fatty acids, and amino acid content. And there's a, you know, this prominent theory that, you know, one of the main reasons we eat is to forage for amino, amino acids, that we'll eat until we get enough of the essential amino acids. And, sure. and we correlate that with taste, but that the gut has neurons, where we know the gut has neurons that signal through the vagus, up through a little relay called the nodose ganglion, if you want to look at it, fun, um, fun name, and then up to the dopaminergic centers of the brain, which make us, oh, when we eat something that has a high uh, essential amino acid content, like a steak, like a really tasty steak, the neurons in the gut in a way that is independent of taste are signaling to the brain, ah, I'm getting essential amino acids. You should eat more of this thing. If those, let's just say a small fraction of those amino acids that are present in a candy bar or in a, you know, a package of, of Skittles, which I'm guessing there's very few of them, if any, you're gonna continue to forage for food because those neurons will also respond to sugar. Basically, it will keep you eating until you get enough of those amino acids. In other words, there are mm. two parallel tracks, mm. one within Multiple our taste system. Multiple pathways to satiation. Right, that are totally, right. Multiple pathways to satiation, mm -hmm. one dependent on taste, one dependent on actual nutrient content. The mouth can only learn taste association. The mouth can't actually learn nutrient content. The gut knows nutrient content. The problem is mm. you take a food that is low in a micronutrient or macronutrient or essential amino acids or essential fatty acids. After all, there are no essential carbohydrates. There are only essential amino acids and essential fatty acids. Right, right, right. And it will keep you eating and it will keep the appetite system revving until you get enough of those. Now, here's the issue. If you've ever done this, so it's probably- So that's empty calories. Empty so calories. Yeah. But what's, oh, yeah. so, so in some ways, um, you know, this again is an analog to the whole discussion around pornography, masturbation, and, and reproduction, mm -hmm. right? I'm not saying that reproduction is the be all end all of sexual activity, but in the evolutionary sense, it absolutely is, right? There's no question about that. I mean, there's no moral judgment there. That's just the reality. So the, 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 the situation with food is, is the following. If we are eating without any gut level understanding of what, what's coming in, we will keep eating. If you, uh, let me give an example. You probably haven't done this experiment in a while, but if you've ever just had, you know, ribeye steak or two, it's pretty satiating. Maybe Very, you also have a salad if you're me or some mm -hmm. broccoli or something mm -hmm. like that. If one takes then, even after you've eaten all that, one bite of pasta, 
one bite of pasta, the, the next impulse is more, yes. right? Even though you already have enough essential amino acids from those steaks, your leucine you know, uh, threshold, you've reached that, et cetera, all the, that good stuff. Why? Because blood glucose goes up and then you desire more because blood glucose elevations are linked directly to the dopaminergic system. So what I'm basically trying to say here is that I do think that there are elements to our food modern food, if you will. It seems like it's you know anything but modern in the sense that it's worse for us than the more primitive foods, but highly processed foods, pornography, any drug that spikes dopamine dramatically, like mm. methamphetamine, for instance, mm. any behavior that spikes dopamine dramatically mm. that very quickly hijacks these circuits. And to me, the way to, to teach those circuits a, a a uh, calmer, more um, prudent version of themselves, right? To enter a different hypothalamic uh, activation pattern is to start breaking the things down into their essential elements, right? About the motivation, the pleasure, et cetera, to tamp all that down. I mean, we know that for pornography, if the pornography is very extreme, then less extreme pornography doesn't seem to work. Mm, well, yeah, that's because there's also a novelty kick in dopaminergic striving, right? I mean, so with any basic appetitive pleasure, there's a dopaminergic kick. But with any novelty, there's also a dopaminergic kick. So there's an optimized threshold for novelty and appetitive mm -hmm. striving that plays out in pornography. Mm -hmm. So um, there's the direct effect of the stimulus as such, but the vi there's variation in the stimulus that's also novel. And so you, it's a common pattern for mm -hmm. pornographic usage to become more what would you say, fetishistic. That's mm -hmm. one way of thinking mm -hmm. about it as it progresses mm -hmm. because that, that keeps the novelty alive. Mm -hmm. well, right? if you that's were to, very dangerous. That's a very dangerous development. Right, and I would venture in a very <clears> different <throat> domain that if you were to eat your steaks slathered in barbecue sauce for a couple of weeks, going back to the way that you eat them now, which by the way, this is a great opportunity to educate people about something that you taught me when we had dinner last, which is that if you're gonna order a steak, order a Pittsburgh char. The oh. char on the outside is incredibly tasty. They're, right, we, right. We, we love that, um, the umami taste. Is that, we should have a devoted yeah, taste yeah. receptor to that. It's complex. Yeah, So, and if they don't know what a Pittsburgh char is, then maybe you're in the wrong restaurant or you need to educate them, but incredibly satiating, delicious, right? Mm. But if you were to slather those steaks in, in a bunch of things, I would suspect that after a while, your plain steaks wouldn't taste as good. Oh, but, certainly. But the way to yeah, make them be... taste good again would be to eat them plain for a period of time in which the stuff, the, all the condiments, et cetera, would start to become aversive. I do believe that when we return to the, the sort of most um, naturally satisfying mode of engaging with these, uh, with these circuits, here we're talking about food and sex in parallel, that they become especially satiating. And I think that, you know, in hearing from all these people that are, addicted to pornography. And they're not addicted like they, it's telling me they love it and they can't stop. They're telling me it's no longer working for them, that, the, that there's this you know, diminishment in the amount of dopamine that they're getting over time and they feel trapped within it. And they have no sense whatsoever because they haven't been socialized to, to go out and find a real relationship, a real sexual relationship or a relationship of well, any kind. It also, it's also, there is some evidence suggesting too that if you've been socialized into pornography sexuality, it's actually quite difficult to establish a sexual relationship with an actual partner. Now, I would say to some degree that's always been difficult because it's a complex form of behavior. But the introduction of pornography, well, it sets up a whole landscape of expectation, for example, that's not necessarily mm -hmm. going to play out that well in the real world, let's say. So, and and yeah, there's also a, a learning of those biological systems in the brain to um, evoke arousal by observing sex as opposed right. to participating. Yes, right, right, right. Complete, right. Completely different. It, so some of these... Um, right, that's voyeur, right? Mm -hmm. You're basically learning to be a voyeur. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. And so you think about young brains that are highly plastic, yeah. learning that. So the returning... Yeah, we have no yeah. idea what to make of that because, mm -hmm. especially for young men, because when they hit puberty, sexuality becomes a very uh, insistent force. And we have no idea what effect pornography has on the development of male sexuality, none.